Tonight, um, we're very excited to have our guest who is uh, going to join us. Um, one of the programs that I'm most proud of uh, that we have implemented since I came to the Dole Institute a little over two years ago is our fellowship program. Each semester we have a Republican fellow, we have a Democratic fellow keeping in the bipartisan spirit of the Dole Institute of Politics. We bring in individuals who have enormous experience and have a tremendous amount to offer to not only the students here at the university but also the community. Uh, that is exactly true of the gentleman uh, who is our Democratic fellow this semester. Our fellows do a whole lot of things in addition to leading political power hours which are a symposium designed to give students and members of the community an opportunity to, to learn about a focused topic. They're around the Institute a lot. You can make uh, check uh, with them for appointments to, to pick their brain about their experiences in the real world of politics. Uh, but they also provide a value added component to what we do here at the Institute. And by that I mean they bring in their friends, people that they've known through their long experiences in politics and were able to create programs like the program that we have here tonight. Our Democratic fellow this semester is Mr. Ed Quick. Uh, Ed had a very distinguished career in public service in Washington, D.C. He was there for 36 years, I believe, Ed. Is that right? 36 years. Uh, he accomplished a lot. He was the chief of staff for Senator Thomas Eagleton of Missouri. He was a legislative director for Senator David Pryor of Arkansas. Senator Pryor, by the way, is now the director of the Clinton Library and Museum. Uh, and as our guest tonight said, and I love the way that Brian put this, as our guest tonight said, when he was serving in the Senate with Ed Quick, Ed was considered the third senator from the state of Missouri. He had that much influence and that much clout and that much power on the Hill. So we're proud to have him as a fellow here at the Dole Institute of Politics. Please welcome him this evening, Mr. Ed Quick. Thank you, Bill. This is only a slight exaggeration about my status when I was working for Senator Eagleton, but I appreciate your comments very much. I have the honor tonight of introducing uh, Brian Atwood, who is currently the Dean of the Hubert Humphrey School Institute of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. You have a complete rundown of his career and your program a long and dis distinguished career in public service. I'm not going to repeat it. I'm going to point out a few things about Brian that uh, I think are particularly noteworthy. He does have a connection to the University of Kansas. In about 1963, he played on the Boston University football team. And he is, uh, says that he helped tackle Gail Sayers. He didn't do it himself, but he did it with a bunch of BU players. And KU beat BU that year. I believe it was 14 to nothing. Uh, he also has a connection to the Dole Institute because when he was the administrator of the USAID, he met with Senator Dole several times to discuss programs of, of mutual interest. My connection with Brian began when I was working for Senator Eagleton and, and Brian was uh, hired in 1972 to do foreign affairs for Senator Eagleton. And he was there until 1977. Uh, both of us were very fortunate to work for an outstanding senator and a fine public servant. And we both uh, have remained his friends since that time. Among Brian's achievements, uh, when he worked in the Senate, he helped write the war powers uh, legislation, which tr uh, attempted to more precisely define the powers shared with the president when the nation is called on to go to war. He, following his service with Senator Eagleton, he was, he was uh, in the State Department as the Assistant Secretary for Congressional Affairs. One of the great uh, challenges at that point was the passage of the Panama Canal Treaty, 
those of you who are old enough to remember thought that uh, that, that was going to be the end of the nation when we uh, signed uh, the treaty uh, and gave uh, jurisdiction of the uh, Panama Canal to Panama. It was a very uh, monumental political fight, and Brian helped uh, achieve that. He was president of the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, where he uh, promoted programs in the Soviet Union and the former Eastern Bloc nations to help them build uh, democratic institutions, uh, political parties, and general political education. As administrator of USAID, which he became in uh, uh, 1993, he was instrumental in this, our nation's response to the Ru Rwandan genocide, to uh, problems in Haiti, to Middle East uh, peace uh, follow-up, and to, he was uh, appointed as the president's humanitarian re relief coordinator for Kosovo. As, as I pointed out, these are a few of the uh, significant things Brian has done. There are some other things that I particularly am, uh, think are noteworthy and which I like. He was, am he was uh, nominated to be ambassador to Brazil in 1988 uh, uh, or 89. And he would have been ambassador to Brazil and he would have been a fine ambassador but his nomination was blocked by Senator Jesse Helms. Now, anybody who has an enemy in Jesse Helms, I think, is a pretty good guy. <laughs> he also has been on the Bill O'Reilly Show four different times and has come out none the worse for wear. Uh, so I am pleased to introduce Brian, and uh, he will speak on our nation's responsibilities to developing nations in crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you, my good friend, Ed Quick, the third senator. Um, I sincerely appreciate that series of exaggerations. Um, uh, Colleen is here as well. These are old friends from Washington, D.C., so it's great to be here among friends. And Bill Lacey, thank you for hosting me. Uh, we just had a wonderful dinner in here where we talked about a lot of things. And I do want to say one thing as well, how much I admired Bob Dole, even despite the fact that often, I mean, I was on the other side of the aisle back then. I'm now nonpartisan. I'm a dean. I'm in academia. Uh, but Bob Dole um, had that quality that enabled him to reach across and, uh, and be friends with people on the other side of the aisle. And the quality he had was he probably had the best sense of humor of anyone that I can recall. Um, unfortunately for him, and maybe fortunately for the Democrats, some people interpreted that sense of humor as being a little sharp on occasion. Uh, but anyone who has heard him speak knows that he has nothing but love in his heart and uh, I think about the work that he did with George McGovern, for example, on the food stamp bill and that legislation, which has meant so much uh, to poor people. And of course, um, a victim of World War II, he has done so much uh, for disabled people in this country as well in his career. Um, so I thank uh, him for creating this uh, wonderful institution. I've been very impressed by the plaques on the wall. I thought I had a few, but I guess I do have a few, and only a few. Um, so let me find my remarks here first. I want to uh, start by saying that I've been very impressed by some of the students and their interest in the world uh, here at Kansas University. and. Uh, we need our young people to care about uh, the future, and in particular, it's a future where the world is uh, very much uh, um, smaller than it ever was, and where people are bound together in a series of opportunities and challenges. Um, I want to talk a bit tonight about American foreign policy, <clears throat> because it's quite clear to me that the last election was uh, 
perhaps the first one we've had in many, many, many years where a foreign policy issue was salient enough to change uh, the nature of our political arena, the arena wherein foreign policy is decided. And uh, obviously the issue in this case was Iraq. And uh, I think uh, we're going to see some very creative steps taken, and I hope it's on a bipartisan basis. Because if anyone thinks that they elected Democrats uh, to the U.S. Congress because they have a better plan than the president, they're wrong about that because they may have 120 plans. Um, and everyone will have a new creative idea. But no plan is going to work in a divided government, and we still have a divided government, unless, of course, the president and Congress are working together. And that's going to be absolutely essential. One other thing was restored in our government as a result of the elections on November 8, and that was accountability, checks and balances. <clears throat> I remember very vividly in 1994, when I had been in office at, as the head of AID for a couple of years, uh, when the Republicans took over the Congress, and all of a sudden my life changed. All of a sudden I was answering questions that were rather hostile. Uh, several people, including my good friend, the distinguished senator from North Carolina, Jesse Helms, uh, raised questions about whether there ought to be a USAID. Senator McConnell raised the same question. And I, I knew that I was living in a different world and that these were the people that I was going to have to be accountable to. I'll never forget the first time after Senator McConnell called my agency an old di a dinosaur and that it needed to be put away, that I testified before him. And I made the decision uh, to underscore the reforms that we had underway at AID. And I went up and had a big brown bag, and I sat down at the table, and I said, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having me here today. I want to show you a few things. And I took out a, a, a dinosaur, a model of a dinosaur, a very large dinosaur. I don't know the names of all of them, but uh, it was very large. And I said, Senator, this is what my agency looked like a few years ago. Everybody laughed. Then I took out a little baby dinosaur, and I said, this is what it looks like today. The problem is, the next day in the paper, the Cayman column uh, said, and this is a gossip column in Washington, D.C., Administrator of AID admits his agency is a dinosaur. Now, where do you think that story came from? <clears throat> but Senator McConnell, I think, appreciated it. We had a good laugh, and we were able to work together, uh, despite, <clears throat> excuse me, despite our differences. That's what needs to be done now. What I want to do tonight is to share a few uh, what I think are realities that should have an impact on American foreign policy, but you won't hear these realities coming from politicians from either side. And it, in due time, perhaps with a bit of activism on the part of young people and awareness on the part of citizens, um, these elements will become part of American foreign policy. The first point, I'll make four points tonight and then add a fifth one for uh, the fact that it is, I believe, International Education Week. I'm not sure whether that week is being only celebrated at the University of Minnesota, but it is certainly set being celebrated there or whether it's around the country, but let's assume it's International Education Week because I want to talk about some aspects of that as well. The first point is that conditions matter. It's not simply about people, evil and good. It's not simply about governments, good and bad, but conditions have an impact on U.S. national interest and our national security. Point number one. The second point is rhetoric matters. What we say as a superpower, even when we speak in a whisper, matters a great deal and everybody is listening. Third, international law and international institutions matter greatly in this world, and I will make that point. And fourth and finally, uh, I will make a point about terrorism. We should never forget that terrorists succeed when they succeed in terrorizing us. And I'd like to amplify on that point. 
<clears throat> my first point is that conditions matter. It does matter that half the world's population lives in poverty. Almost half the world's population, I should say, to be more, to be more accurate. And at least 1.3 billion people live in extreme poverty, which is less than $1 a day. A few years ago, I decided to put some thoughts down on paper about this, and I wrote an article for the New England Journal for Public Policy entitled The Link Between Poverty and Violent Conflict. Uh, it, I did some research and found that the literature with respect to poverty and conflict wasn't extensive. There was hardly anything written about this on an international scale as it affected the developing countries of the world. But there was a great deal of liter literature written by sociologists about inner cities in the United States, about poverty in this country and its relationship to crime. And a couple of sociologists that wrote about this with respect to the inner city in Chicago that had done years of research came to the conclusion that poverty had a very negative effect on social cohesion. They called it in their fancy words, uh, collective efficacy, that collective efficacy is hard to achieve when people are poor and desperate and, and don't know where their next meal is coming from. Now, especially in a world of telecommunications where information is flowing as quickly as it is, the gap between rich and poor is the subject of grievance in the developing world. They see the rich getting richer, and that's been happening. The poor haven't necessarily, by the way, becoming poorer, become poorer, according to the statistics. But the gap is greater. And people in, who are living in poverty are feeling more and more alienated, more and more angry. And this has an impact. And their failure to achieve social cohesion within their societies causes violent conflict. And it causes many other things as well, of course. It causes people to move across borders as refugees or displaced people. It causes infectious disease. It causes um, ethnic groups to identify or religious fanatics to see the only hope that they have is to identify with their subgroup rather than even their national group um, or a broader religion. So thus you have in the Islamic religion the division between Shia and Sunni, for example. So there's a great deal of tension that is caused by this, but this has a direct impact on us as well. When infectious diseases invade our country, it doesn't help to have a strong military. There's other reasons to have a strong military, but a strong military is not going to, cause, not going to stop the, the spread of infectious disease. Of course, poverty destroys rainforests, which contain CO2, greenhouse gases. It causes immigration. Today in this world, there are some 190 million people who have moved someplace else, either legally or illegally. There are about 45 million people who are refugees or displaced people. They cause great disruption when they move because they're moving to relatively healthy societies, more healthy societies, I should say, and they destabilize those societies as well, including our own and including the Europeans. Now, there's a great debate about immigration in this country, and I tend to support the president's position on this, and we're going to see what uh, is the result uh, with the next Congress as to how we deal with this immigration issue. But it's even more intense in Europe. And what we're seeing as a result of the immigration pressures in Europe is the, the return of radically uh, fascist politics, people that are um, basically re reviving the old parties of, uh, that caused the, the problems for, in World War II. And we're seeing it in a number of European countries, and it's a very dangerous trend. It's causing tension within those societies. It's, it's making it more difficult for them to deal with terrorist cells within those societies. And it could cause a real breakdown in the West. And this is a trend that we ha are going to have to watch very carefully. Another condition that we have to worry about is global climate change. It's happening. 
human activity is exacerbating the problem. Old traditional trends still exist. I mean, we're going to have warmer periods and we're going to have colder periods, but those periods, warmer and colder, are going to be exacerbated by climate change. Now, the fourth assessment report of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is about to be released. It's been held back because of a dispute as to the conclusion which these 10,000 Im imminent uh, scientists have, have reached based on the science. I think a number of us in this room, maybe there are still some skeptics, but a number of us in this room intuitively understand that weather is affected by climate change, violent weather in particular. There's more humidity in the air, the, the surface of the oceans is warmer, there is more uh, fresh water being dropped into the saltwater oceans and changing currents underneath and the like, and all of this creates much more violent weather. Well, that fact is in this fourth assessment, and it hasn't been released because of opposition by the U.S. government. That will be released soon. The impact on the poor in the developing countries is that they, uh, their agricultural production is affected negatively. They, of course, if they live in poor infrastructure near the coast, are going to be racked by bad storms, and many of, more of them will be killed. It's interesting when storms like this hit the United States, and we, of course, seen the worst in the Katrina storm, but when normally when they hit the United States, we're able to recover fairly quickly. The insurance companies don't like it because they paid a lot more money out in the last several years. But when they hit a country like the Dominican Republic or Haiti, where I visited on presidential delegations after the hurricanes hit there, or Hurricane Mitch in Central America, uh, the loss of life is devastating. I once visited little, two little villages uh, near this volcano that collapsed in Nicaragua uh, with President Clinton when I worked there. And uh, I, I can't tell you what the devastation, all you saw was mud. And of course we met with some of the survivors and their entire families had been wiped out. They were so traumatized they could hardly speak. So my point here is that as we look at American foreign policy and how to conceive it in the future, it can't just think about nuclear weapons, good countries, bad countries, bad people, and strategize on the basis of that. You have to think about conditions because that exacerbates everything else. And you can't have a complete foreign policy unless you take that into consideration. Second, the rhetoric of our government matters a great deal. We have uh, come through an era of rather astonishing hubris, and we're all responsible for this. I'm not blaming anyone in particular, but we felt as the only superpower that we could get away with, with basically establishing our hegemonic area as the entire world. And if anyone came up as a threat, uh, we would deal with that threat. And of course, after 9-11, the real question was, whether or not we were simply feeling vulnerable or whether we were feeling hegemonic. And what that means is that we wanted to extend our influence everywhere or were we doing that to protect ourselves against terrorism? I think we were schizophrenic at that point and there were some who felt more hegemonic than vulnerable but thought they could take advantage of the vulnerability and the fear that we had. During that period, we declared war on terrorists. I'll discuss that a bit later. We declared three states, Iraq, North Korea, and Iran, as an axis of evil. Now, I don't know how you would feel if they declared Kansas University as part of an axis of evil, but I would feel perhaps a bit threatened and that maybe someone was trying to declare war on me. Um, then again, you know, I once went to war with the Jayhawks and tackled Gail Sayers, as Ed has mentioned before, and uh, it, it was a collective efficacy act. We had eight of us that tackled him, and <clears throat> I'm not going to get into that game because uh, we pushed you all over the field and lost 14 to nothing, but uh, um, we stated um, explicitly, and I want to make this distinction 
We stated explicitly that we would strike preemptively against threats even before they were fully developed. Now, no American president has forsworn the possibility that we would strike preemptively if we felt that there was an imminent threat. But this was a different standard, and it scared people around the world. We've declared our interest in our intent, as other presidents have, to spread democracy throughout the Middle East, while at the same time we abandon the effort, really abandon the effort, to bring the Palestinians and the Israelis to the peace table. And we established that policy through the beachhead we created in Iraq. Now, I believe very strongly in uh, a value of our foreign policy has to be to promote democracy, but we have to promote it effectively. We have to promote human rights, respect for others, and we have to do it through others, letting them decide how fast and how they wish to proceed while we stand by ready to help at any moment. But we can't impose it, can't impose it from the outside. And when we speak that way, our rhetoric is interpreted in ways that we never intend. So, the consequence is that our old allies in Europe or in Asia and our enemies have become more ferocious, ferociously anti-American than ever before. And they have taken steps to prevent us from establishing American hegemony. You know, in the old days, uh, foreign ministries would open up the day and they would have their cup of coffee or tea or whatever they drink, and they would be thinking, how can we help the United States protect us against the Soviet Union or whatever? Nowadays, they wake up and they go to their first meeting and they say, how can we protect ourselves against American hegemony? We don't want them thinking that way. We want them to think that we are a partner in dealing with the problems of the world. I know there's a great deal of interest in this room on Sudan. My next point is to say that international institutions and international law is extraordinarily important. Extraordinarily important much more so than we have given attention to it in the last few years. Um, I served on the Secretary General Kofi Annan's panel on peace operations. There were nine individuals. I was the only American. And this was at a period in 1999 when we hadn't been paying our dues to the United Nations, so it was a little awkward to be the only American on that panel. But what we looked at was the ability of the United Nations to make peace through diplomacy, to keep the peace through military operations, peacekeeping operations, and to build the peace by helping countries that had gone through conflict or crisis to rebuild their societies. And the United Nations has a major role to play in all of that. What we concluded was that the United Nations did not have the capacity to carry out the instructions that was being given by the member countries of the Security Council. As you know, the Security Council countries run the United Nations. And what we found was that they weren't giving the resources. They would pass resolution after resolution to do this, do that, send peacekeeping forces here and there. So one of our recommendations, frankly, was to say to the Secretary General that if they pass a resolution and you don't have the resources, then you should just table it until they come up with the resources so that you could carry it out. We are every day, practically, even in the Democratic administration, I know the Republican administration is very skeptical about the United Nations, but even in the Democratic administrations, we were setting up the United Nations to fail. And we have more influence there than any other country. Now, how does that relate to Sudan? We passed a genocide convention through the United Nations. The United States has ratified it. What is genocide? It is obviously the, the wiping out of a particular ethnic group. That's what's happening in Darfur. The United States, uh, in the person, person of uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell, declared what was happening in Darfur to be genocide. 
Uh, he later said that that doesn't incur an obligation to act. And when Robert Zellick was involved in trying to negotiate uh, the peace between the South and the North, the, Ara the government, mainly Arabic in the North, which had been fighting for over 21 years, the African population of the South, we decided that it was more important to bring about that peace than to deal with Darfur, and we were asked by the Sudanese government not to raise the issue. So we put it aside, and we put it aside to the detriment of the 400,000 civilians or so that have been killed in Darfur, and they're still being killed to this day. I believe we have a moral obligation to act when genocide is being committed in the world. Someone asked me earlier, why then are we not acting? Well, there's only so much in any administration can do. And of course, in this case, the Security Council is being stymied by the Chinese who have an interest, an oil interest in Sudan. And of course, I don't know how we take the moral high ground when we have oil interests all over the world. How can we say to the Chinese, you shouldn't care about the oil interest, you should care more about the moral point being made here. I think we need to use our diplomacy to convince the Chinese at a minimum to abstain at the Security Council. And I think we have to come to the conclusion that we need the international community and the United Nations system to bring collective action to bear on issues that are of importance to us. Non-proliferation treaty, we need to reinforce it. The Koreans dropped out of it, the North Koreans, um, saying they didn't need it anymore. It didn't afford them any protection from us. What they want now is a direct security guarantee from the United States. We need collective action to deal with climate change. And we cannot avoid going to the negotiating table on that issue. This is causing great anger in the world. And uh, it's something that we need to deal with. So. There is much that needs to be done through the international community and through international law, and the United Nations is a broken system that needs to be reformed to deal with the problems and challenges of the 21st century. It can be fixed, but it cannot be fixed by simply standing back and criticizing it. As I said earlier today, and I made this point in Minnesota where it has more, uh, more reverberation, but I said it's like like blaming the United Nations for all of its failures is like blaming the Metrodome for the failure of the Twins to win in the playoff game. You've got to understand that the United Nations is just that. It is nations. The member states run the United Nations. The Secretary General is a figurehead. He doesn't have much power. And we need either to empower him or to give the United Nations right to act uh, without our sanction or we need to figure out how we can actively make the Security Council system that now exists work better. Um, it's extraordinarily important in terms of our own interests because we can't do this alone as we have now learned. We have, I think, in the last few years gained great humility in terms of our ability to act in the world. And I hope and believe that uh, President Bush in his last two years will return to a statement that he made when he ran for president, saying that he will conduct our foreign policy with great humility. I believe he meant it at the time. He just surrounded himself with the wrong people, but uh, that's another matter. Some of those people have now resigned, so maybe we can go on to a better time. I want to say one more thing about the United Nations, <clears throat> because about four years ago, during International Education Week, I was asked to give a lecture called the Walter Judd Lecture, at the University of Minnesota. Walter Judd was a congressman from the Minneapolis area. He was a doctor, a medical doctor. He was a son of a missionary. He grew up part, part of his life in China. He was a Republican. He was a conservative. He was a strong anti-communist. Walter Judd, in 1943, in the summer, joined a bipartisan delegation of members of Congress to tour the United States his area was the Midwest, and so he spent most of his time in the Midwest. He roomed with a rather obscure senator from Missouri by the name of Harry S. Truman. He actually roomed with him. I mean, would you imagine that happening today? So when I was researching Walter Judd, 
I went to the files of the Truman Library, obviously through the Google. I didn't travel to the Truman Library. No one has to do that anymore. But uh, what I found was a, an interview, that he had, an oral history that he had given about that trip. And he explained what he told his audiences about why they should support this new concept of a United Nations. He reminded his audiences of the story of the Western territories and how the West was won. He said there were three stages of security for the people who captured the West. The first stage was what he called the individual armaments stage. He said every man carried a gun on his hip, but it didn't give him adequate security because two or three others would gang up on him. So the second stage, Judd called the formation of alliances. This was the effort, he said, of law-abiding citizens to form alliances to counter the cattle thieves and the highwaymen. The third stage, Judd called organized security. It's when we join together in communities, not only to provide for our security, but to provide for the health care and the education of our citizens. <clears throat> he then went on to say, this was 1943, that the world had become interdependent and that the United States economy wasn't simply operating internally anymore, that it was operating externally as well. And so he believed that we needed the United Nations, both as an instrument of collective security and as a way of dealing with other countries with respect to our own interests. I thought that was quite impressive back in 1943, and I thought it was typical of someone who comes from the Midwest. They talk straight. There's no, no flourish about it. And he made his point, and I'm sure he made it very, very successfully. There's an even, even greater need today, obviously, given the kind of chaos that we face in the world and the kind of crises that we face. We can't handle these matters alone. We need help. So international laws and international institutions matter. My last point is about terrorism. I think it's about time that we develop policies to combat terrorism that do not play into the hands of the terrorists. Just imagine yourself, hard to do, but imagine yourself as an Al-Qaeda terrorist. Imagine that you're bin Laden. If I were bin Laden, I would like nothing more than to have the American president declare war on me. What is war? War, by definition, is a conflict between states. So what do we do when we declare war on al-Qaeda? We elevate them to the level of a sovereign state. We give them the title that they wear proudly. That title is enemy. I think they're nothing more than international criminals, horrible criminals, and we should deal with them that way. But if I were the head of al-Qaeda, I would like nothing more than to place the United States into a permanent state of war that would have us violate our own citizens' civil liberties and maybe even get to the point where we start torturing the people we capture. What better way to show the contradictions of the American promise of liberty and freedom for all and justice? What better way to contradict ourselves? I would like nothing more than to see the United States bogged down in a country like Iraq. And I would welcome the president setting the goal of victory because I would know the only thing I have to do was to avoid being defeated. All I had to do was crawl back into my hole because it's not as if I'm a standing army. I'm a revolutionary. I'm a terrorist. All I have to do is hide in my cave to avoid being defeated. Why don't you hear this kind of rhetoric from Democrats or Republicans? No one wants to sound weak. The fact of the matter is that people still think in Cold War terms. They still exaggerate the ability of our military to, to fight against a terrorist force. There's an example of that that came up recently in the Hezbollah attack on Israel across the southern Lebanon border. 
Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. They hide among civilians. They sent a rocket into Israel. They provoked Israel into sending a standing army into, into southern Lebanon. I think Hezbollah wanted to achieve that goal. All they had to do was hide to avoid defeat. And in the long run, despite the fact that we encouraged them and did not support a ceasefire at the UN, the Hezbollah forces won a great political victory. They're seen as stronger now than ever before, and the Israeli democracy, which is a strong and vibrant one, is doing nothing but criticizing their government for having failed. It's an asymmetrical threat, and it should not be dealt with as a sovereign state. What we need to deal with terrorism is good police work, sharing intelligence information with other countries, good diplomacy to cause that to happen, making sure they can't transfer money from bank to bank, interfering with their networks by intercepting their communications, making sure we understand the grievances that cause some 200 plus cells to uh, begin to operate in the United Kingdom, which was announced last week. What is it about these people that were born in England uh, that causes them such grievances that they would actually become terrorists? We need to understand them better, and we need to stop using rhetoric that cannot be achieved. So, I will go on with my final point, and that is especially a point that's relevant to International Education Week. What I would say is this, and I returned a week ago from New Zealand where the World Congress of the American Field Service Youth Exchange Program uh, met, and I happened to chair that organization. Uh, having been an AFS student at the age of 16, uh, an experience that changed my life. And that is that we need to encourage more of our young people to have an intercultural learning experience. There is nothing like it. It transforms the way you look at the world. And if we really want to bring peace to this world, we will have people that have the capacity to look at other cultures and appreciate them. There is a uh, process, according to the sociologists, that people go through when they have this intercultural learning experience. Uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a process that goes from being defensive about your own country, and I remember going through this myself. So the first phase of the process of evolution is defense. You see only the good in your country and all the bad in other countries. The second phase is when young people, some young people, are exposed to another culture. They all of a sudden turn on their own country and they only see good in the other country. That process is called reversal. Now that's pretty destructive thinking in both cases. You get to sort of the neutral stage, which is called minimization, when basically you can see both sides, but you're not using it constructively to move on. And so that stage is called adaptation. And the final stage is called integration. Now, does this mean that you leave behind your pride in your country? Does it mean you leave behind your patriotism? Not in any way. I feel just as patriotic today as I ever did about my country. I'm proud of what we represent in the world, the best of what is America. But I also think we need better understanding of other cultures. We need better understanding of religions that we don't see often enough, although we have a large Muslim population in this country. We need to understand better what that's all about. And we need to take up causes. We need to take up causes like Darfur, or previously apartheid in South Africa. Because we can do something about these. We are living in the age of globalization. The internet is a powerful tool if it's used by the right people for the right causes. So in this time of International Education Week, I hope we'll think seriously, you young people, about getting an intercultural experience, and you older citizens about the issues that I've raised today so that one day we'll have a debate between presidential candidates that take up these issues rather than putting them under the rug and not talking about them. Because if we're going to have a viable foreign policy, we have to think about all of these things. Thank you very, very much.
take it there are questions, Bill. Is that what, what happens now? Okay. Thank you. Well, you just said uh, Hezbollah was a terrorist group. Or did the United Nations or the European Union or the African Union or the Arab League consider Hezbollah as a terrorist group? That's the first question. The second one is, if the Iraq invasion of the Iraq war was illicit? Thank you. Um, Hezbollah has taken indiscriminate actions against civilians, innocent civilians. In my mind, that defines them, and they define themselves. Now, I know that Hezbollah is also a political party, and they actually have people in the Lebanese uh, government. And if they were to uh, operate within that context and were to forego uh, terrorist actions, then I would revise my definition. But I'm not talking now about a legal definition, although the United States State Department has declared them to be terrorists. I'm talking about a definition that they have given themselves. Now, was the invasion of Iraq um, legal? There are individuals who have said no. Um, I believe we should have had United Nations Security Council approval uh, to do that. And I also think that it would have been more effective if we had done it that way. Um, of course, the argument at the time, and the only argument that would have sustained a, uh, the legal basis would be that we did it on a, because of self-defense. We did it because we believe there are weapons of mass destruction that could have been put into the hands of terrorists uh, that could have, of course, attacked the United States. You all know what happened to the weapons of mass destruction. So the basis for the legal arguments was not there, but I honestly believe that uh, Democrats and Republicans who voted on that, uh, that declaration of war, which is the essence of what it was, uh, also believed that there were weapons of mass destruction. I don't think that that met the international standard that I would like to see uh, for a self-defense action. I believe that that is, should be based on an imminent threat that is provable. It wasn't in this case. Um, I have an awfully broad question, and I apologize in advance for that. But um, referring back to the United Nations, as you mentioned earlier, besides the United States actually pursuing the payment of its obligations to the United Nations, what other reforms do you feel are essential in making the United Nations effective for developing nations currently? Well, first of all, it has to become a meritocracy rather than uh, the Secretary General having to assign people to the various jobs at the UN on the basis of which region or which country that they come from. They have to give the Secretary General the power and authority to run the place um, the way any CEO would run an organization, but they don't give him that power. He's more of a figurehead. I mean, uh, one example is the oil for food crisis of the United Nations. Now, everyone can be uh, legitimately critical of the United Nations for messing that up and seeing a lot of corruption assigned to that program. But it is true also, and I was in the Clinton administration when this happened, that we wanted that oil food program to go through. We were sick and tired of Saddam Hussein saying that uh, his most vulnerable people were suffering because of the sanctions. And we wanted to give him at least a little bit of that oil money so he could spend it on his own people. Did he do that? No. Did we know at the time that this was not uh, a system that could track every dollar? We did, but the political imperative was, let's put this on the United Nations. We actually sent an auditor there to try to track it, but once that those resources, of course, were out of our control in Iraq, we couldn't. And so it's hypocritical, it seems to me, for people to blame the Secretary General in the United Nations for something that was impossible to, to monitor in the first place. You could argue it the other way as well, but I prefer to argue it this way. We uh, expect the United Nations to conduct peacekeeping missions, but uh, they have a, very, a peacekeeping office that has a few military officers who control thousands of military forces from a variety of countries that sometimes don't even have equipment, 
all over the world, and uh, if we were to suggest what is called a teeth-to-tail ratio like that for the American military, the American military would go nuts. They'd never allow that, never allow that kind of command and control structure to exist. It's horrible. It's set up to fail. The same is with, true with peace building. Every time we get into a situation where we have a conflict like Iraq and we're trying to bring peace, we do it on an ad hoc basis. We need a permanent institution at the United Nations that is professional and knows how to do this business. The, ma the main point of the United Nations, beyond all of the other good things it does, is peace. That's its main mission. And yet we expect it to do that job with both hands tied behind, tied behind its back. And it's not just the UN's fault or the Secretary General's fault. It's the, it's the powerful nations that don't give the United Nations the wherewithal to do its job. I was curious if you could speak to uh, the period of time when you were with uh, USAID and, and um, the head of that organization. If you could talk to your uh, talk about your experiences um, um, in running that organization um, in relationship to two pieces of legislation which seem to heavily impact how that organization is run, the Buy America Act, um, as well as the um, USAID's mission being tied to current uh, United States foreign policy. Yes. Well, it depends on what the foreign policy is, but if the foreign policy of the country is to help developing countries develop themselves because it makes for a more peaceful, prosperous world, then I can live with it being tied to American foreign policy, but that's not often the case. And if you use those development dollars to achieve other short-term goals, then I'm afraid we frittered away our long-term investment in that more peaceful and prosperous world. By America, uh, has been uh, seen as an essential element to selling the foreign aid program to Americans and to their representatives in Congress. So some 70 to 75 percent of all the money is spent here on consultants, on services, on goods that then go overseas. Now, that doesn't mean that a lot of that work uh, isn't good and that we don't produce results with it. But I wish we were untied in, from that obligation. I still think we'd probably spend a good percentage of our money here on, because you know we're tapping into a rich vein of creativity and innovation here. You know, there are people, just met one tonight, your dean of your graduate school, who knows a great deal about how to create debates and how civil society should deal with one another. And we need to use expertise like that overseas. Agriculture, we helped create, helped create the Green Revolution by sending people like Norman Borlaug, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, to India to work with Indians to help them improve their agricultural production and become self-dependent. Self, uh, so um, there are things like the obligation to send American grain to humanitarian crises overseas on American bottom ships, which cost 10 times as much as it cost a ship on another shipping line, uh, that I would like to see changed. I would like to see us in emergency situations buying grain from countries that have surpluses to help them with their agricultural production. There are a lot of things that could be done you know, to make us more effective in doing the job. But we're never going to get there if we continue, for example, uh, to subsidize our agriculture so that uh, we undercut uh, the, the ability of any country to compete with us, even within their own markets, where they don't even have to ship anything, uh, or if we create uh, trade and finance laws that do not enable them to participate in the global economy. But we haven't gotten to the point of political saliency yet. People haven't yet seen poverty as a challenge and a threat to the United States. So neither party is going to take up these issues. There's too much a cost uh, to them politically. That's why I hope younger people can get active on these issues so that they can educate the members of Congress on these, on these points.
Um, my question is regarding education. I was just wondering if you could comment on um, what you think the importance of education in developing nations is, and in particular, um, the Arab countries where a lot of the uh, um, radicals um, and terrorists seem to come from and what effect that would have there? Well, it, it, there's nothing more important than education. Um, although if you didn't have a roof over your head and didn't have enough food to eat, you would think those things were more important. So when you get those basic needs taken care of, there's nothing more important than education. Big problem in the developing countries is that many, many countries don't educate their girls. And so some say 33% of your women in your society are, un are un uneducated. What a p wasted potential for the society. And so there is a major effort underway by donor nations working with the developing countries to try to redress that problem. Um, primary education is, is, has to be a target because many developing countries don't get kids past the first or second, third grade. And uh, I remember once having a discussion with um, the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, Julio, not Julio Iglesias, but uh, Enrique, Enrique Iglesias. I say Julio is the singer from Spain. Uh, <clears throat> he said, you know, as I look at Latin America as a whole, uh, I see the need to pull us from about a sixth grade average up to at least an eighth grade average, which is where Asia is today, if we're going to sustain the economic growth they were then experiencing. Y you have to understand in this global economy, it's no longer a an issue in terms of development of your comparative advantage. You may have oil, which may be a comparative advantage. You may have low wages which is a comparative advantage. But if you take advantage of that as your way of developing, you're in a race to, the, to zero. You're in a race to the bottom. You have to have competitive industries. You have to have competitive products, whether it's tourism, or which brings in a lot of hard currency in a lot of these countries, or whether it's agricultural products or whatever. You need to compete in the global economy. And we're not going to uh, make up this difference, this gap between rich and poor, unless we realize that it's in our interest that those countries do develop in that way. And they can't do that if, if their children are not educated, and they can't sustain democracy if their children are not educated. Um, I guess I should stand up. This is nerve-wracking. <laughs> I just have uh, one question. You've been saying that as young people, we should stand up and make politicians take notice of what we actually care about. And I'm just wondering exactly what would you have us do? What would actually get people's attention? Because we have student organizations, um, we have rallies, we have all these different things, and it doesn't seem like it's making all that much of a difference. So what would really drive the message home for politicians in America? Well, as Student activism has made a difference in the past. It certainly um, made a difference in ending apartheid. Uh, I think it has, it's beginning to make a difference. It's beginning to be felt in the, on the issue of Darfur and much more needs to be done. But you have a very powerful tool through the internet. But obviously I believe very strongly that students should get involved in politics with either party or any other party that comes along that you think has merits. Uh, it's really important for uh, m most campaigns, of course, wouldn't exist without young people. And so get out there and uh, find out what these politicians, what these candidates stand for. I am the co-chairman of a political action committee. I never thought I would say that. My co-chairman, the other co-chairman, is Republican Congressman Bill Frenzel. Our political action committee called America's Impact, you can look it up on the web, supports candidates that are good on these international issues. On the international issues, some of which I've been discussing tonight, we obviously have some differences. Uh, we have a bipartisan board and we fight out what you, which issues we want to look at. But one of the issues on which we rate the members is Darfur. You can make your impact in that way, 
by supporting an organization that does support candidates. Now, it's never happened before. There are a lot of advocacy groups in international relations, but never has there been a political action committee that has actually supported candidates on the basis of their positions, the positions they take on international issues. It's an extraordinarily important new initiative, and it's, I think, a vehicle uh, for students and for others. You going to save me, Bill? <laughs> I'm, I really enjoy this, so if there are other questions, I'm happy to. Uh, you spoke at the very beginning about how poverty can be seen as um, the basis for a lot of the problems experienced in developing nations. What role do you see for debt forgiveness in alleviating this endemic poverty? Well, I believe very strongly uh, governments go through transitions and some governments are terribly irresponsible and they roll up debt uh, internationally. Now, um, I believe very strongly that we should forgive that debt, but only if a government has put in place reforms so that that debt doesn't return. So, I mean, I, I've, we've done a lot of good work in forgiving debt um, but it's always, and I think it always should be, tied to economic reform uh, so that there is discipline within an economy so that you can't just spend money you're not, you're not taking in. If you do that, it's a basic fundamental principle of economics. Uh, you're going to create more debt and on the backs of your citizens. So I think while some countries really bridle at this fact, uh, it's important to tie the forgiveness of debt to that condition.